Hello, everyone, and welcome to the premier meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society's Astrophotography SIG meeting. We did have our very first uh, AP SIG meeting back in May, but that was more of an organizational type thing. Uh, so tonight we officially kick off with our first regular season, and we have an excellent guest speaker tonight. So without further ado, we're going to jump right into it because I don't want to wait. So tonight's guest speaker is recognized as one of the best astrophotographers in the world today and has won several awards for his work. In 2012, for example, he was the recipient of the Hubble Award, one of the highest awards for excellence in astrophotography from the Advanced Imaging Conference. To date, 98 of his images have been featured on Astronomy Picture of the Day's website. He developed the National Observatory's public stargazing program at the Visitor Center in 1996, which is at Kitt Peak National Observatory. And in 2008, he founded the Mount Lemmon Sky Center Observatory for the University of Arizona. He was also a columnist for Astronomy Magazine for two years and is a pick site ambassador. And if he's uh, kind enough to make a return visit in the future, we'll definitely have him back to talk about uh, Pick's insight in more detail. So without further ado, please welcome our very first AP SIG meeting guest speaker, Adam Black. I see waving, so that's good. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, Richard, that would be a very uh, technical talk for the Pix Insight part of things. This presentation is not technical. So I'm going to share the screen. And uh, I think the idea behind this presentation is more to be uh, a more general audience kind of presentation. Now this is a you know a group that is into astrophotography. So some of the things I'm going to say uh, are going to be things that I, I'm sure are already well known. I'm hoping that even if you know some of this content, you'll have a, a better understanding of the way that I think about things. And some of the things that I might suggest might be things that you uh, might inspire you to do other projects on your own. So in that sense, it'll be very general. Sometimes, you know, the talks are very specific and you spend a lot of time uh, going over some technical thing. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm not gonna do anything technical, but it allows me to be a little more wide ranging in the things that I wanna talk about and things I wanna say. So let me try to do that here by clicking this. And I'll start from the beginning. Oh, I can't start yet. If you look in the chat, which I will now get back to here, I'm going to post a link right now for those that may have just um, gotten in there. Now I need to find a way to do that. Let's see. I'm going to, there it is, the chat. I'm going to post this link because it is a link to my website, which is here. So my website is called adamblockstudios.com. It's the site that I publish all of these instructional videos for those that are interested in uh, creating astrophotographic images, right? Especially with PixInsight today is what I highlight. Uh, but what I did for this talk is on my site, I published the PDF version of the, the slides. And why that's nice is because if you go follow that link right now, you can download this PDF to your own machine. And as I talk about things, you can see the images on your own machine as they are supposed to look rather than through Zoom, which is kind of, uh, it's gonna muddy up things a little bit. Not terrible, but there might be some small details I point out that'll be harder to see on Zoom, where if you look in the PDF, they'll be plainly obvious. So it's something that I've done in the past before. If you wanna grab the PDF, that's a good place to start. Uh, the link is in the chat, or as you can see here, it, just go to my website and go under resources here, and you'll find the right page for the, uh, the PDF. Okay, now I can start my thing. So the talk I have titled, and I need to get this off the screen here, uh, To the Ends of the World with Astrophotography. And I think that that's a, a good talk because this is a talk that is about reach. It's a talk about sharing, about popularization, about what makes images compelling in some sense. And, uh, and I'd like to show you some images and give you 
the kinds of perspectives that I would often use in the course of doing public outreach. Uh, so I actually begin this presentation with the very image that you see here on the screen, which is an image of the outskirts of the coma cluster of galaxies. You'll see uh, some of these galaxies here, the one in the left, bottom left corner is NGC 4921. And it's a beautiful spiral galaxy on the, uh, as I say, the outskirts of uh, the coma cluster. And the funny thing about that is that is a perspective in and of itself. Because if you look at uh, the coma cluster and you kind of zoom out here, this is the full frame of this image that I took uh, of this part of the coma cluster. But the concentration of galaxies is just off the field here to the top. If we look at what is basically towards the center of the coma cluster, you have a view that looks like this. You'll see many more galaxies, but notice that none of them really have very nice spiral structure. You need to look at the, the outermost ones to see that. And that has to do basically with just kinematics. Galaxies interact very strongly with one another in these galaxy clusters, especially in the center where their gravitational mingling uh, distorts or completely eradicates the, the fragile spiral structure of galaxies. So in the centers of you know, galactic clusters, you just don't see spiral structure very much. Now we live, the Milky Way lives on the outskirts of a very large uh, cluster of galaxies, the Virgo cluster. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we live on the outskirts of one of these clusters because we live in a spiral galaxy. So this picture is a wide field image of the Virgo cluster. It doesn't look all that exciting, but if you put labels on all of the galaxies in this image, you can clearly see the gradient literally of galaxies where the cluster is kind of parked down here in the in the bottom right towards the center of the Virgo cluster. Now we're some 40 million light years away. Um, so when we look towards the center, we do see a concentration of galaxies. And what I need to now do, let's be sure, yep, is do a trick. I am now going to try to navigate to one of my other screens like this. Because what I did, and this is actually a live image here, let's see if I can zoom in, is I just put pictures, I've taken a, a, a pictures of many of these galaxies that are in the Virgo cluster, right? But you'll notice that again, they truly are all on the outskirts. So here we have uh, M101, uh, M100, sorry. And then further on down, beautiful um, M88 is here next in, at least in this direction of the skies, M91. Uh, and uh, I didn't do all of them. I just did a handful, like I have one of uh, 91 there. Here is uh, what I think is perhaps one of the most beautiful galaxies uh, in the Virgo cluster. I love M58. I think it's one of the coolest galaxies up there. But you can clearly see that there is kind of this, uh, this region that you get interior to, and you just don't see that many other spiral galaxies. That's a perspective. That tells you something about the fact that these galaxies, they're moving. They interact very strongly with another, one another and those interactions uh, morphologically change the nature of what we see. Uh, so that's a kind of perspective that I like to offer. But uh, another part of this perspective, and this is a very recent thing, is uh, of course near the heart of the Virgo cluster is the tremendous galaxy M87. So M87, now I need to get back to my presentation, which I wish I could go backwards. I don't know how to go backwards. Is this my presentation? Yes. M87 is a super large galaxy that of course is basically created by the amalgam, by the, uh, the combination of so many other galaxies coming together and colliding and making a big, huge thing that contains trillions of stars. And one of the interesting things about M87 is that because of this mass, it has a super massive black hole in its heart. We've known that for a long time in the sense that we could see indirectly that there's something very powerful in the center of M87 uh, by virtue of this jet of high energy gas and radiation that is coming out uh, from the center of the galaxy, looking at the HST image of the same. By the way, uh, this is my image, right? If you didn't know, you can clearly see uh, through, you know, long enough, uh, say longer than 2000 millimeters or so, uh, focal length telescope, you can see the jet 
in the heart of M87. It's a cool imaging project to do. But here, of course, is only a very small version of the HST image, which again shows the jet with all of its wonderful detail. Uh, but what makes this cool is, of course, that um, as of, you know, not but six, nine, I don't know how long it's been now. Maybe it's been a year now. Uh, but not until this image, black holes and unicorns were in the same category, never having been seen before. But with uh, this new image of the black hole, at least the accretion part of the black hole here, in the center of M87, we have some direct confirmation that, look, there is actually a thing there that is powering all of this energy coming out. And it's, it's a huge story in and of itself as to how this image was created, basically combining the light in radio wavelengths of many telescopes scattered around the Earth, effectively giving you a telescope the diameter of the Earth in terms of resolution. And that's what enabled this image to be created. To give you a sense of the resolution, though, Imagine looking at just, you see the kind of the bright spot in the middle here. Imagine one pixel in that bright spot in this picture and then divide that pixel by about 10,000. And that would be one ten thousandth of the size of that pixel is roughly the size of this thing, which is just amazing, right? So that's the kind of perspective I like to offer. It is that we live in a galaxy. We have uh, a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. We live on the outskirts of a cluster of galaxies. Uh, there's another cluster of galaxies out there. All of these things, I feel it's important put into context or perspective when you want to publish an image like this. This image looks like a, a red donut, an orange donut of some sort. Without that context, it's kind of meaningless. And I actually wish that when the astronomers first made their announcement, they went through something like what I, I didn't do the full thing, but something like what I showed, putting into perspective where M87 is, where it is with respect to our own galaxy, why galaxies have uh, supermassive black holes in their centers, how large they are, so on and so forth. Why did they look at M87s instead of our own? Well, the answer is because Within our own, it's, it's actually a little more difficult. It's not as large and it has intervening gas and dust in the way. It's actually equivalent to looking at this other, uh, even larger supermassive black hole, even though it is much, much farther away. So those are perspectives that uh, I like to offer as part of my the public outreach that I've done. And I am extremely fortunate in many, many ways, very, very lucky in terms of my imaging career in that uh, one of the things is that I got to start this whole thing, when CCD cameras basically became a part of uh, the amateur world, the amateur astrophotography, out of the realms of just uh, the professionals. And so when they became available, those first moments is the moment that I first got to uh, play with them. So this image here of the globular cluster 2419, I took through a 20-inch uh, telescope, F15 20-inch telescope, uh, on the campus of the University of Arizona using, uh, I, I can't remember, this might've been the ST6. I started with the ST4, which is just a guider camera, uh, but with an ST6. Now later, of course, uh, much later, you know, with better cameras, bigger telescopes, better techniques, I can generate an image of the same cluster that looks like this. But the first image kind of gives you a sense of what I first started looking at and got me very excited. I'd spent a lot of time at the telescope trying to generate those kinds of pictures. Uh, and so this is actually the telescope here that's at the University of Arizona, where I was a telescope operator in college, and I would spend many nights instead of going to the football games, where they would turn on the lights and I would get angry. Uh, I spent the night there um, at the telescope trying to do stuff. One of the things that I was successful at was, uh, and this was kind of an example of my first taste of doing real public outreach for kind of real people outside of the university venue, was that uh, Hyakutaki. Uh, came around, the comet, beautiful comet, and uh, I basically set up an evening, a public evening event that would allow people to see live images of the comet. Now, with your eye through the telescope, at the, this was not yet when it was visible by eye easily, uh, but you could take images with a CCD camera and then put them in the room so people could see them, uh, and that was a new thing. So I was excited to do that, and uh, the reason that I, the real reason I have this picture, though, is you'll notice that I took this image, this is before the public outreach event, and uh, I was up at night with a very particular person here. 
you'll see that the contributors are me and this person called Miwa Marita. Well, she later became my wife. I met Miwa at college 20, more than 25 years ago. And um, well, there you have it. There's, there's got to be something about the fact that she would stay up at night with me trying to make a crazy little image like that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's kind of, a, again, uh, very lucky and fortunate in, in, in numerous ways. These are the images of the comet that I took at the time. What was interesting is that you can see there is kind of this activity coming off the comet at the very night that we were observing it through the telescope, which was a lot of fun as well. Later, as was mentioned, I went to Kitt Peak Observatory and I began my astrophotography using, of all things, uh, an LX200. Now in the day, these telescopes, not only were they not designed for doing astrophotography, they were anti-designed for doing astrophotography. Very hard to make them work. In fact, uh, I believe that I am the only person to ever have, and this is kind of a weird one, an, ast uh, an astrophotog uh, astronomy rather picture of the day taken with a CCD camera through an LX200 of like a deep sky object, like galaxies or something like that. That's it. That's the only one. It's really hard to do. Uh, but that's how I began the public outreach programs um, at the National Observatory which, with that kind of equipment. Later, got bigger telescopes, better equipment to do uh, that public outreach. So that was just the beginnings for me. And I just wanted to show you kind of a perspective and then uh, my journey is one in which I have had the opportunity to stand in front of, literally with breathing beings, uh, people, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's 100,000, maybe they're hundred thousands, but certainly many, many tens of thousands of people in the course of doing these evening presentations, either at the National Observatory or later at the Mount Lemmon Sky Center. And it's funny that I, I'm usually, you know, uh, um, described or uh, introduced as an astrophotographer. But if you ask me how I'd like to be introduced, it would be as the person who developed these programs, because that's really where the, uh, the emphasis for me is. Public outreach through these kinds of images is something that has wonderful reach, which I'll describe in a moment. But, uh, you know, it's the work to develop those programs that are really, that's, uh, the astrophotography is only a facet of all of that. And uh, one of the things that I generally explain to people has been one of the more influential and powerful things about imagery, astronomical imagery, is the ability to do what is effectively HDR processing, uh, the ability to manage the brightness levels of images. People today that do astrophotography may not remember the days where that didn't exist. You never saw images. Um, that were displayed in a way that showed you as much information at one time as you can now do in almost any software program. So I'll show you an example, but I'm going to claim that this ability to be able to display images in a non-linear way is one facet of astrophotography uh, that had a huge, really big effect. So uh, one of the things that you might find interesting if you didn't know is that idea behind doing um, HDR imagery actually began with, among other things, the atomic bomb, because there was a problem of the Kodak uh, folks, they needed to record these atomic bomb explosions, seeing not only the initial flash, but the subsequent, you know, stuff that happens. And uh, that's very, very hard to do. So they developed special film um, and a special way to do this kind of special image, which you see there on the screen. Uh, so that's actually the beginning of HDR, so with atomic bombs. But uh, many people have been doing this kind of thing for a very long time. Ansel Adams in particular, I would say, uh, is someone who manipulated tonal values and images to make, to bring out information that you would not have otherwise seen. And of course, he did it in a way in which uh, I uh, philosophically am very close to where uh, one of his most famous quotes is that there is nothing worse than a sharp image of a fuzzy concept. One of the things that I'm going to say about the astronomical images is that there is a kind of expression that you can do, a kind of story that you can tell, 
And those stories can be compelling. And I'm going to make some strong arguments that I'm not wrong about that, but uh, you'll see if you agree with me or not. So others that have manipulated these tonal values to show more information at any one time, HDR-like things. David Mallon is a, a, a very good example of this. He developed a number of techniques to do it, photographic amplification. He also used on sharp masking, all kinds of things to bring out this information in the images. Um, and I, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think one of the, the big changes in astrophotography was literally being able to see um, as you're working on the data, what the data looks like in a nonlinear way, literally like a photographic representation because photographic images are nonlinear just by, uh, by their nature intrinsically, uh, but uh, CCD images are not, they're linear. What you see is you either see the very brightest thing, you don't see any dim stuff on your screen, or you see all the dim stuff, but then the bright stuff is all blown out. It's all white on the screen. Now the values themselves, of course, are not saturated or uh, blown out or anything like that. It's just how it's being displayed. So a display like this, and this is in the program called CCD Stack that I used you know, more than 10 years ago now, um, was one of the first to be able to display images in a nonlinear way. And that was, a, now that was something that took some time for people to really get used to. Uh, but then that affected the kind of choices that you would make when processing your image because you could literally see what was there in a way that you couldn't otherwise do. Uh, so I think that that is very influential. And as a good example of this, I, I always like to show this particular galaxy. This is NGC 5866, which is very, very bright. And for many years, most people taking a picture of it, the picture would look like this. Um, and the funny thing about this is that you know, when you look at a picture like this, it looks cool, but there's more information there that I think speaks to the story of this galaxy than you get by looking at a picture that is processed in this way. So one of the interesting things is to be able to apply these nonlinear adjustments to the image and show more of this information. It's kind of like the Gray's anatomy of a galaxy. In other words, uh, you know, if you looked at someone's body, their, their arm or something, you know, normally you just see the skin. But in Gray's Anatomy and those uh, wonderful diagrams of the human body, you get to see all of the tissues and bone and stuff like that. So this is like the Gray's Anatomy version of uh, a galaxy, which allows you to see uh, another story that can be told here, which is that it, it is a spiral galaxy viewed exactly edge on, but it has these wonderful you know, tidal tails and other effects probably due to the interaction of other galaxies uh, that have tipped and tilted this thing through time. So that uh, you, you tell this greater story about what's going on here. And th that's, that's a very powerful interpretation. And this interpretation, um, as of the time that I made this image, uh, was not very well known. There was an image, HST image, of this galaxy that show just the center like this, but it didn't show everything, right? You don't get to see it in color because HST images mostly are, you know, scientific filters, not full uh, broadband images. And uh, you didn't get the big full field of view. So this image, I think, encompasses more information about this object than most others do. And uh, that's exciting. Here are just some examples of images that I think really benefited from HDR types and I'm just saying HDR is a general term, types of treatments. I believe that I can go to here and I can show you uh, something closer to the full resolution. Oh, sorry, let's do that again. Uh, full resolution view of these images. So this is uh, M88, which is a beautiful spiral galaxy as you saw on the outskirts of the Virgo cluster. And, oh, it doesn't allow me to do that. Okay, sorry. And this one is uh, 1398, which is actually very hard to view from even here in Arizona. It's really a Southern object, but even so, this is, a, I think, a fairly good rendition of this particular galaxy. And for me, it speaks, it's nice because uh, this one was one of the, I don't, I've never really had any cover images on a cover of anything, but I did get a cover image by s and Sky and Telescope put this on the cover 
of Sky and Tell in January. And so that to me was just huge. I just really, really had a great time with that. Okay. So that is the idea. Oh, I skipped it. Sorry behind some of the HDR things. There is a particular algorithm in PixInsight that is called HDRMT, which allows you to do uh, this kind of uh, treatment of galaxies. And I should say of nebula as well. I guess I have that image of the uh, lagoon nebula. Here is the lagoon. And it's only with that kind of treatment that you could show, ah, sorry, that you could show the inner structure as well as all of this wonderful outer details of, you know, everything that you wanted to see in the galaxy. There is uh, something else that I want to point out, because this will come up later. One of my philosophies, so here I am, I'm now going to tell you, this is a very strong opinion of mine. One of my philosophies behind doing astrophotography is a lot of people today, they'll post their images on the internet, and their images are, you know, they're 600 pixels in size, they're this big. Well, anything looks great 600 pixels, right? So I generally, as a rule, process my images so that they look reasonable at 200%. And I almost always make available images that are something near to the intrinsic resolution that I capture the data. Um, it's one thing to make a 600 pixel image look good. It's another thing to do it at the intrinsic scale that the data was acquired. So just something to think about as a challenge for astrophotography. It is kind of that, that next level of being able to make these um, astrophotographic images. These are some of the telescopes that I've used through time. As you saw, there's the, the LX200 there. Later, we got a 20-inch uh, at Kitt Peak. And then um, I created the uh, Sky Center programs that I've been using a 24-inch telescope initially, and then the 0.8 meter, the 32-inch telescope, which those programs, all of these programs are still operational, both at Kitt Peak and at the top of Mount Lemmon. Nowadays, um, I am doing research for the Department of Astronomy using the astrograph there on the left. And that is a very wide field, it is like a four and a half degree field of view of pieces of the sky uh, to do work with um, the night sky brightness and satellites. And on the right, um, I have been lucky to uh, buy some time on telescope live instruments that in this case, the 24 inch telescope in Chile. And that is a wonderful opportunity in and of itself to get uh, from the hemisphere, which opens up another effectively universe for me uh, to take advantage of. So I've really enjoyed that a lot as well. So here is an image of the near Rigel, which is the kind of the bottom foot, knee, whatever of Orion where you'll find the Witch Head Nebula, which you can see here. Now this image is kind of upside down as it appears in the sky, but I like this. Here's the kind of Witch's Head thing coming at the top left. And one of the questions that I am often asked about when showing these images deals with a color. The question is, are the colors real? And I'm gonna say in this case, the answer is yes. These colors are real in the sense that they are the same colors that the sensor detects having been white balanced in the same way that you would with your digital camera, if you take a picture outside. So if you have a digital camera and you took a long enough exposure, just a regular digital camera through the telescope, this is what you would get. Of course, I'm using a CCD camera that is more sensitive than a, just a regular DSLR camera. So it's, it's easier to get this uh, level of signal to noise, this contrast of an image like this, but I am not choosing that some parts of this to be red and some parts to be blue. Those are the wavelengths of light detected by the sensor in the range that it is sensitive, which is the same as what our eyes are sensitive, the same wavelengths of light. So this is broadband imaging. Now, one of the things that I like about broadband imaging, today a lot of people do narrowband imaging, which has a much more open, if you will, parameter space for making images because there isn't a, um, there isn't necessarily a definition for how to combine the colors. Uh, you, can do, you can choose whatever color mapping scheme that you want. But one of the nice things about choosing a consistent color mapping scheme, as I am doing here, is that the colors you see in the images, as they change from image to image or object to object, the changes in color are due to the physics 
of whatever is taking place in the object itself. That's one of the nice things about having a consistent gamut uh, across all of the images that you take. Um, it so happens that most of the imaging that I've done to date has been a broadband, just RGB imaging, uh, though I'm going to be hopefully expanding into some narrowband stuff because now in Chile, I, I have the opportunity maybe to get my hands on some of that kind of data. So uh, continuing then, here's a picture of the Pleiades that I really think takes advantage of this, this idea of presenting images in a way that offers information that maybe not often is highlighted. So, you know, it's one thing to take a picture of some unknown thing, which I'll show you in a moment, but it's another thing to take a picture of something that is very well known and present it in a way that might be different than you would otherwise normally see or expect, but different also in that it conveys a certain kind of information, an expression of something about the object. It has intent, if you will. And my intent here was really to show this field in a way that demonstrated that there are literally different depths of the gas and dust in the frame. And you can see the differences in those depths by the color uh, that's presented. So you'll notice that there are these wonderful blue striations of the uh, reflection nebula, but then behind them, you'll see this kind of yellow, brown, dusty stuff that pervades the area in this part of the Taurus molecular cloud. So I really liked this particular rendition of the Pleiades because I think it showed it in a way that is not often shown. So let me continue here. Uh, I gotta remember, don't click so many times, okay. And just to get to the point, I hope this page, this is your website. This is the page of the uh, Kalamazoo Ast Astronomical Society. And lo and behold, the image that I saw as the header on the page was mine. Now it's not labeled anywhere as mine. I know it's mine because I made the image. It has my style and it's my signature on it. I, I just know it's my image. Uh, I processed it. But the point here is that someone from your, you know, your club, your association, asked me to be a speaker. And unbeknownst to probably either us, either uh, you know, Richard or myself, I mean, I didn't know that my picture was gonna be there. He didn't know that my picture was being used there. Yet someone, whoever the web designer is, must have at some point looked at images and thought, hey, you know what? That picture looks pretty good. I think I'll put it as a header. Now the question is why? It is my hope, it wasn't a random pick, it is my hope that some of the decisions that I made about processing the image is what made this image, for whatever reason it was, stand out amongst perhaps others. Uh, I do think there's real power in this expression of images. It's not just a, a foo-foo thing. How could I make that happen? I, I don't believe that it's just because someone saw my name or knew who I am. I don't think that everyone knows Adam Block or something like that. I think it's because the person just thought the image looked good uh, and, they put, and they put it on the header of the website. So I think that that's, uh, that's just a case in point of being able to show images in a way that is compelling. Now, as far as the public outreach is concerned, I would always strive to show some kind of perspective, these stories that I like to tell about the nature of the universe in what we see in the images, because knowing those stories might affect perhaps the way in which an image is processed, because you might want to retain some of those things about the image. The Orion Nebula is a particularly good example of this. I'm going to now go to my image of the Orion Nebula, which is here. And if you zoom in, uh, there are a couple of very important details. Detail number one is that you'll notice that I have the trapezium stars here, but then surrounding the trapezium stars, there is gas and that gas has color. Let me say it again. The gas around the trapezium stars, it has color. In the center of the Orion Nebula, color is not lost. And yet, if you look at most images of the Orion Nebula, you'll find that the color is gone. It's hard, but if you use particular, you know, again, this uh, nonlinear representation to try to manage those brightness levels, it is possible to color all the way down into the center of the Orion Nebula. 
And for me, this is a hallmark of what makes a good picture of the Orion Nebula, because I think it tells a wonderful story, one that's not often uh, told. Uh, as another example, if you raise the contrast too much, for example, you might lose other stories. Notice here, although it's very fragile, that uh, near the trapezium, there is a star that has kind of an arc here. That is kind of like a bow shock due to the fact that these stars have such a tremendous stellar outflow of radiation and gas and so on. They are literally blowing the gas behind these stars uh, that are forming. And that's not the only one. Look, there's a bubble here, and the bubble probably being blown by this star here in the gas cloud, it's not centered on the star because again, those winds are blowing the, the bubble behind the star. Same thing is true for this here. I think these are wonderful stories. How could you not want to keep that kind of stuff in these uh, images of something as, as great as the Orion Nebula? And that illustrates this idea of uh, stellar revolution, the fact that stars do have very strong winds and that's what regulates the amount of star formation that you might have in a cloud of gas like this. Ah, good, I did it right this time. So now I'm gonna pick on someone. It's the only group I'm gonna pick on. So I, I'm gonna be, I, I get to critique somebody. How could I not? I have to, there's no other way for me to explain things without contrast. So it's a public image that's, this is by CFH and uh, they often publish images and they do, they have a very particular style. This is a group that uh, they never show big image. They always show the 600 pixel size. You can't ever see the large version of their images. That's a critique. And then another critique is that uh, I don't often know the story that they're trying to tell, to be honest. I know it's a bright image, uh, but in this image, the story looks like color saturation to me. I don't see the detail. I don't see the contrast. I see the center doesn't have the color. So that's my critique. I don't know. I mean, I know it's a, it's a striking image in the sense that it has a lot of color, but I don't see a story there. And so that's a different kind of image to me. That, that's my critique. And um, so these are the kinds of regions that really lend themselves to wonderful stories. A region like Ro Ophiuchi here is uh, the region around Antares where you have a number of different colors. So the story really is the color in the contrast between the, uh, the reflection nebulosity, the, the yellows around Antares and the reds uh, that are the glowing clouds of gas, but also the depth one of the nice things about this image is that um, the contrast that you can achieve in an image like this really lends itself to bringing those features in the foreground. You can see that the attenuation of starlight is really what gives you behind these clouds of dust, gives you that sense of depth. I mean, it's not, it's real depth, right? Because these clouds literally are in the foreground and that uh, unlike very few other places in the sky. This is really a, a beautiful example of having those kinds of depth clues. And that's an element of the picture that I would always want to retain. If you raise the contrast a lot and you make these clouds very, very dark, you will lose that gradient of attenuation of light. And then I don't know, that would be a different story you would be telling. You would tell a story about the cloud itself rather than how the cloud is affecting the stars that are behind it. Oh, I did it again, oh, sorry. The moon is a wonderful example. People nowadays can take these really good examples of uh, pictures of the moon where you show the subtle differences in coloration. That's a wonderful story. And uh, I've seen some really good pictures of this. My picture is not uh, one of the best, but I was able to you know, raise that color saturation here. Going crazy with the color saturation is a, this is a good case where trying to show those subtle um, differences in color to show you the subtle differences in the, uh, in the surface of the moon is really kind of cool. Another kind of way to exploit stories is something like this. This is a picture of Betelgeuse. And so, I think that this is an, an example of the idea. It's more the concept than it is the picture itself. The concept is who would bother to spend 
you know, eight hours staring at one of the brightest stars in the sky. I would, because I wanted to know what it looks like. I wanted to literally see a bright star against the background of whatever was there. Lo and behold, it's kind of cool that uh, Betelgeuse has some stuff floating around it in the background, which makes it kind of cool. So you see all the stars, and then you just see this overwhelming, of course, glow of light. Now, much of the size of what you see here is being dominated by just scattered light. Uh, technically, and you can't see this in this image for, oops, sorry, <clears throat> can't see this in this image well, but there is a diffraction pattern. Uh, Betelgeuse is actually a tiny thing here in the middle. Uh, but this glow of light is just, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of cool, uh, but there's tremendous scattered light there. Um, in the public presentations that I would give, these other kinds of concepts are very useful. Here, this is a concept, again, a field of view taken with the astrograph. You can see clearly how half a degree, the moon on the sky, uh, appears on the sky. is much smaller than the galaxy, which really does extend four or more degrees across the sky. And that really offers a beautiful perspective about field of view, about um, size, about the faintness of things, because with your eye, you don't see that, but you take a deep exposure and you do. And now I'm gonna ask for maybe Richard to pipe in here just for fun, because I, I don't wanna tell you the answer on every picture. So Richard, are you there? Yeah. Okay, so here's a picture I took of Orion over the, um, the learning center, one of the dorms in the, uh, uh, well, on top of Mount Lemon. Do you see anything weird about this picture? There is something weird about it. Can you figure out what it is? Because it was the choice that I think makes it a compelling picture. Nothing Pick stands out. Stands out. What I see, there's something about this image that's not natural. And, and if you know what the natural state of things are, and then you look at this image, you go, oh, I see what the guy did. Well, of course, but, you, pa you pasted the, 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 the foreground space in front yes, of the background, yeah. That's true, but it's the background that's weird. And what's weird about the background is that the sky gradient is gone. You see, when you go out into the night sky, anytime, all the time, there is always a gradient of brightness, even in the darkest places in the world, you have air glow. So the sky will be darkest high up, and then it'll be brighter as you near the horizon. That's everywhere. But if you remove that gradient, as I did, and then you show the stars as if it's just a flat field of stars, right? That gives the image a different sense. And that was a choice. Now, it may not have been an obvious choice, but that puts a little bit of a different take on uh, just a, you know, what is basically an earth sky twan type image, right? Uh, so that was the that was the idea. I was going to see if you could identify it, but that was the that was the trick, if you will. So uh, another uh, kind of leading perspective that's very similar is this idea of field of view, um, and this idea of resolution and putting the connective tissues between different objects or different regions of space. So here is the entire constellation of Orion that I took using a, you know, just a camera lens and the, the Canon RA. And uh, what I'm going to be highlighting here is actually M78. So you can see Bernard's loop, which is just the left of the belt stars of Orion. Here's the Orion Nebula. Here is where you'll find the Horsehead Nebula, all of that. You probably already know the Flame Nebula. Uh, this little blip right here is where M78 is. So if we zoom in effectively, and now I'm gonna show you a picture with the wide field um, astrograph, you get a picture that looks like this. Here again is Bernard's loop, supernova remnant. And now we can see um, M78 where it lives in this part of the, the constellation. You can see the flame nebula down below. And then one more time, now I'm gonna show you a two panel mosaic that I took of the uh, M78 region using uh, actually the 24 inch telescope in Chile. And I believe that I may have forgotten to load that particular image. So if you allow me, I'm going to, uh, what's the best way to do this? I will do this like, where is my browser? Uh, is that a browser? No, well, that's a browser, but on the, oh, this is the browser. This is my browser, Adam Block. 
my, the website where I post images is called adamblockphotos.com and it is the most recent image. It's this one here. So the full image is this thing here. And it's really a beautiful you know, piece of sky where you see this, uh, these interactions of things. This is a thing in and of itself, the, the action that's going on down in the lower dark cloud. And then of course the upper cloud is wonderful and it's uh, all of its detail of all those clouds of dust. So that's, uh, that's M78. Let's try to get back. Good. Uh, no. So now my presentation is here. All right. That full progression then, I tried to illustrate in some different way. In fact, I, I made this an exhibit in a, in a local um, art show where I made three metal prints like this. And you can imagine them hanging next to one another of different sizes. So I made one small, then one bigger, and the largest uh, zoomed in is the largest one. To, get, to give you that sense of continuation of scale uh, and all of that, of a place in the universe. I, I kind of like that, that perspective. And uh, let's see, what time is it? I am getting there. Okay, so this is an image of uh, another choice. And I'm trying to show you some of the choices that I make. They might inspire your own choices in astrophotography. Here's a picture of the uh, North American Nebula, but you'll notice that I included the stars. I actually think that this image, I like this way better uh, in the sense that one of the stories about this part of the sky, it is in the galactic plane, literally. And um, the gradient of stars, say from going from the top into the, the regions where you have these clouds of gas and dust, I think that that's a, a wonderful story to be told. If you make it so dark, you remove all the stars and you just show red stuff, I don't know, that's a different story, uh, but I kind of like this story. Whereas in other images, the reduction of stars uh, through star de-emphasis is one that I think really does add power. And so in an image like this, you know, the stars are really not part of the story as much. They're more of a distraction if you want to be able to see a wonderful cloud of gas and dust like this or like these. This is part of the Taurus molecular cloud. And the Taurus molecular cloud is a beautiful place in the sky that has all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'll show you some examples here. One of the interesting things about doing astrophotography is to be able to take pictures of things. So far, I've shown you pictures where there are plenty of references. Uh, but one of the skills in astrophotography is to take a picture and to process it where there literally is no reference anywhere that exists. There is nowhere else you can look to see what someone else did or what might be right. The only way to to process that image is to make these decisions that I've kind of describing here and do it in a way that utilizes all of those skills independent of any other reference that exists. So this is a good example of this particular galaxy. If you search Google, you will not find any other real high resolution, full color um, RGB type color images of this particular galaxy, NGC 3261. So I always like that challenge to be able to take pictures of things where there just doesn't exist a, a good example. This galaxy is very well known, but again, uh, very few, very good examples of high resolution, full color images of it. And I think it's an overlooked kind of galaxy. It is bizarre. Uh, this is a starburst galaxy that has probably been hit by a number of other small galaxies. And it has all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. Not only does it have the outer loops of loops of gas, or excuse me, loops of stellar streams, uh, but then the uh, clouds of gas in it are forming stars at a prodigious rate and it's making these very interesting structures inside. So this is a, another kind of wonderful story to be told about this particular kind of galactic interaction. In fact, uh, I am fortunate again to have had the opportunity to take pictures of galaxies and discover, actually, um, something about them. In this case, I discovered some star streams that are around another galaxy. I specifically took it upon myself to look for galaxies that are of the right type, not too far away, the right kind of spiral galaxy, and so on. And I just got very lucky. Uh, one of the ones that I chose to examine, this one, NGC 3614, 
actually had some um, stellar streams, which was just really cool. So I am actually working to reprocess this data right now. I took this image back in 2015, and at the time, it didn't have the tools that I have today. Um, so now I want to reprocess and see if I can do a little better. You can see that I'm, I think I'm doing the disk of the galaxy better here. You can see more of the structure and star forming regions uh, and so on. But uh, uh, I did have this opportunity recently, and this is something that people should also think about if you find some kind of scientific um, either discovery or something that is uh, significant, then you can do things like this. This is a, I made a research note at the AAS that uh, kind of, um, it lays out what I did for this observation so that other people, other astronomers in particular, will know that there are star streams around this particular galaxy. Um, this is a picture of, uh, this is a picture that shows you know, keeping your eyes open for things. You never know what you're gonna see. So comparing your images of galaxies to old images, you never know, you might find a supernova. So this is a supernova explosion that I found in this galaxy 6214 some odd years ago. And there, again, there really weren't that many other high resolution pictures other than a Hubble image. Um, this is a picture here from the DSS, but that was good enough actually to show of course, there was no error there at the time, right? Uh, but to show that there was indeed a supernova in that galaxy. And later, because I did make that submission, other astronomers looked at it spectroscopically and determined this that indeed was. Uh, I believe this was a type one supernova. And then kind of finally on this last set of uh, slides, I, let me just show you some of the pictures that are of the lesser known areas. At the time that I took this picture, there were no color pictures of this particular object. Um, the, again, it's another one of these things in the Taurus molecular cloud. This is SH2239. And just, uh, I, ju I just, could, I could not believe um, what this image was looking like after I took the initial data. It's just such a fantastic piece of sky. Never thought that you would see all of this. Uh, these are kind of like these Herberg Harrow type objects embedded within this particular cloud of gas and dust. Uh, this was uh, an image that was highlighted uh, many years ago, uh, actually for the one of the competitions for the, um, what's it called? The uh, Astrophotographer of the Year thing by the UK group. And uh, here's another molecular cloud thing, which is, uh, uh, it's a variable star in Taurus. And I just think it has this wonderful structure surrounding it, baby stars here. And uh, yet another example, this is CW Tori. In fact, in my data, if you blink the data, you can literally see the star change its brightness in the quarter of weeks, in the order of weeks. Uh, it goes bright and dim and bright and dim. It's really cool. Um, as another quick critique, um, I'd just like to mention that when looking at astronomical images, one of the things, uh, you know, it's like anything, news stories or anything else, there is some uh, critical thinking that would go into looking at an image to understand either what's being expressed or whether the data is free of artifact or artifice in some sense. So here is a, a fairly good image that I took of the Whirlpool galaxy showing all the detail and the, the dust lanes and the interaction with its companion as well as many other background galaxies. But, um, I'm going to pick on the uh, C, CF, uh, H people again. Here's a picture that they took back in, uh, I think this might have been, I can't remember what it is, 2018, uh, of, the, of the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's a very nice image. Again, a very bright image. I guess the story here is really all the looping clouds, like a, a streams of stars from the interaction, which I, it's a good story to tell in an image like this. But then they publish an image like this. And this one, was published just not but uh, this year, I believe, because they had a new camera, much wider field of view. They could take deeper images. But you'll notice that there's this red stuff here. What's that? Look at their earlier image. It's not there. You'll see this bright star here and that galaxy there. And then if you look at those same features here, we should see at least the hint of it, even in their old picture. And it's not. In fact, regardless of their old picture, of any picture, um, I am not aware of any picture deep exposures that show it other than them. I believe that it's a flat field error. 
I don't think that that's a red, that's a real red thing. And, uh, and I criticize him for publishing it. Yeah. What can you do? So you got to have a critical mind when you look at images like this. I mean, is that real? Is there a red cloud up there? What is that doing? What's the physics of that? What in the world is that? You know, so there's, there's some responsibility that goes with publishing images of astronomical images, especially if they're going to be, uh, you know, in the public domain for people to see and, uh, and use or interpret as they might wish. This is another example of the same kind. Now this was this is an older image, so granted, I you can give them a little slack here, uh, but it's a beautiful image with the VLT, an eight meter telescope image, of the Crab Nebula. But do you see what's weird about this image? Am I to believe? Now this is a narrow band image, by the way. This is not a full color image, so this is mapped color. But am I to believe that the left side of this object is mostly red and the right side is mostly green? Is that what I should interpret by this? I mean, I see wonderful detail, but I also see a gradient of color. And that gradient of color, I suspect, is again, a flat field error because it's just not the job. It's just not what professional astronomers do is to take pretty pictures of space. And maybe they didn't spend the time. They didn't think it was important. I don't know what, of course, I think it's important. Uh, and so I, I critique it, uh, but I did actually use this wonderful image because it has one other wonderful attributes one of which is the resolution of the image. And in terms of resolution, now I will go to, does anyone see, hang on, I gotta think about where my browser is again. Where's my browser? That's not the browser. Well, this is my image of the Crab Nebula. And then what I did is I took my image, which was taken in 2012, and blinked it with the image taken much, much earlier. And uh, that of course tells uh, the wonderful story about the expansion of the Crab Nebula, which if I am able to find my browser, I promise you, I will show you, I just can't find it, one second. Doesn't matter, I'm gonna get to my browser. <laughs> Oh, that was it. That was the browser. So it is here. This may not play well on, let me turn off the volume here. Hopefully you can see this. If you look very closely at the uh, red parts of the nebulosity, you can see that the they expand over that you know, that time period. I'm sure everyone has seen this expansion before. But at the time that I took this picture, this was one of the few high resolution color images that shows that change in the Crab Nebula in this time. And the, at the time, the, it got some, uh, there were a number of other versions of this image, but it got you know, a lot of views. So at the time, almost viral, not quite, but it was pretty good. And that is the kind of reach that I really want to do in terms of uh, public outreach, you know, the reach that I'm able to do when I speak in front of people, that only goes as far as my voice will carry. But these images, as you can see, have much far more ranging reach than I could ever do in that other way. And so, although it's only a facet of what I do, it sure is a powerful one. And I've tried to take advantage of that over my um, career in doing this. In fact, so powerful is that reach that uh, sometimes it comes with some problems. So here's an example of that. There was uh, uh, an Italian amateur astrophotographer who uh, thought that I, I, I'm gonna say, he thought my images look pretty good. So he blended my image with his and submitted it on another number of places, this image of the uh, NGC 891. And it was, the. Um, accepted in a number of different places as award-winning images. In fact, it was published as an astronomy picture of the day with his name as his image. So uh, his blend though was like, uh, what was it like 20% his image and then 80% my image. In fact, uh, it was so uncanny that when I saw the astronomy picture, I thought, man, that's a good image. I wonder who took that image. But then when I look more closely at the image, I noticed something, only something that I would notice because it's the kind of story that interests me. You'll notice in the bottom left of the galaxy, there are two stars in the disk. And those two stars, not only are they resolved, which you generally don't find in many pictures, 
but they also show the slight difference in color. One is blue and one is yellow or orange, yellow. And I swear, I'm the only one that ever cares when processing to make sure in NGC 891 that that shows up. And I saw it in this other picture. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. But then I zoomed in and I noticed there are many other similarities and I, you know, I discovered that unfortunately it really was kind of my image that he was uh, using. So now the question is, why did he use my image? What, what was it about the image? Well, there must have been something compelling about the image, some features of the image, some part of that expression that he wanted to incorporate in his own. And what are those things? Well, those are the things I'm trying to describe. Those are the things that I'm trying to name uh, in this presentation. And uh, then finally, uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to do, and it is actually the reason why I wanted to have this particular presentation. I do note, though, that I have reached my hour limit. So what I was going to demonstrate is something that is not about astrophotography, but it's actually about um, a kind of simulation, actually, of galaxies. And it goes one step further to telling a, a different kind of story based on the stories you actually see in an image, just like this one. So Richard, do you have time? For... Absolutely, absolutely, keep on going. Keep on going, yeah, because this will probably take me, I don't know, eight minutes, seven minutes, something. Perfect. Okay, well, here we go. So here's a picture of uh, M33. And M33 has these wonderful clouds of gas that are forming stars. In fact, I created an enhanced version of this image because part of the story I wanted to tell was that it has these star forming regions. So the way you do that is you, you add the hydrogen alpha data in some reasonable way <laughs> into the galaxy and it makes these H2 regions uh, show up even better like uh, NGC 602 here. But if you just look at the HA data, you're literally seeing a map of the clouds of gas. Now the entire disk is filled with gas, right? But you're seeing the clouds of gas that are currently undergoing star formation. That's what you're seeing kind of here or, or other reasons, but uh, here in this uh, just H-alpha alone image. And that's tied to another very interesting idea about galaxies. So uh, I mentioned that there exists the idea of simulation of things, physics, or the world around us, that can be accomplished with very simple rules, but that somehow leads to a greater emergence of complexity. And uh, the most famous example is John Conway's uh, Game of Life. And this is a, a computer simulation, it's called a cellular automaton, that has rules for pixels. You basically start with rules, and I can show you those rules right now just for fun, because I have the Wikipedia page somewhere here, yes. And basically the rules are for a pixel, I, this may seem like totally off topic, but I promise it'll come together here. You know, if uh, any cell that has fewer than two live neighbors, it dies because it's lonely. If you have any cell that is any pixel in this case with three neighbors, it lives. And then if you got more than three, oh, you die because of overpopulation. And then if you have any cell that's just dead already, it can come alive if it has three live ones running near to it. So just with four rules here, you get all of this crazy complexity that you just saw in that uh, animation thing here. You get things that, you know, multiply, self-replicate, they move, they do all kinds of things. You iteratively run this program and you would not have necessarily been able to predict from the beginning based on those rules, the the kind of complexity and the kind of, um, you know, uh, emergence, if you will, of stuff uh, that you get. And uh, so this is a powerful way to examine the universe, to, to think about things and uh, understand it an underlying nature of the way things work. Now, I say that, but then I'm going to very quickly say the following thing. For any astronomers that are in the room, for any physicists, for any mathematicians, for anyone that has a beef about this. I am not saying that what I'm about to show you is an accurate representation of anything. That's not what this is about. What I'm trying to show is that there is a perspective where you can apply simple rules in computer simulation and you can come up with 
behaviors or patterns that are potentially explanatory or at least show similarities to the world around us. And that I don't think is a coincidence. And so that makes it a powerful way to do a certain kind of research, a certain kind of understanding of things. And so this is an example of that. What I uh, created is a galaxy out of these uh, cellular automaton. In other words, I made my galaxy be comprised of, call them cells or pixels or clouds of gas for lack of a better word. But a galaxy that's defined by this then is just imagine rings of pixels. So you have an inner ring and then you have another ring outside of that, it has more pixels because the ring is bigger and you keep making rings and rings, bigger rings, that is your disk of a galaxy. And then you apply some simple rules to this galaxy. Rule number one is you rotate the whole thing. So you have a rotating uh, clouds of gas for your galaxy disk, just like a real galaxy. And rule number two is that you have star formation. And star formation in a galaxy can be triggered, and this is the way it really is, either by the formation of other stars, uh, because their stellar outflows compress other nearby clouds of gas, triggering them to form, or uh, supernova explosion, which is another very powerful way to trigger star formation um, in a galaxy. So you have this star formation that occurs, and then it triggers leading other star formation to occur next to it and so on. So you have a wave potentially of star formation. So let me show you what that kind of looks like when you try to simulate these simple rules. I have here, let's see, what did I use? Yes, I used this. So this is just a very simple example. I basically made screenshots of what's going on here. And uh, let me maybe back up. Yeah, here is, this is just early on. So each of these rings represents clouds of gas, right? And if it's white, it represents like a star blowing up in the clouds of gas. So if you look towards the, uh, let me see, I need to do that. If you look at uh, here in this maybe spiral arm, the red stuff, represents anything that is actually lit up represents uh, clouds of gas that are currently forming stars. So there is a chance, there is just some small percentage that that might trigger some supernova to take place where it might trigger some adjacent region to start forming stars. But there's just some uh, chance, some uh, percentage, very small percentage that's put into the program. So if we go forward in time, I'm doing literally one step at a time here, you can see the two little blips lit up. And then if I go forward another step, they might trigger little blips, uh, little star forming regions next to them to turn on. And then as you proceed, the colors change, the color represents the age of the cloud basically. And so you'll notice that although we had that star formation there, after those stars initially form, or the yeah, star forming happens there, nothing else happens after that. They just die away. So if I just keep going in time, it dies away. But if you look at other regions, let me uh, get to some other region, like maybe here, and you go forward in time, you'll find that uh, it does obviously persist. And I'm not doing this very well here. Let me see if I can do this. There, you can see that there's some formation occurring there and it becomes self-propagating in that it makes like a spiral arm structure. So it makes a self-propagating uh, self -propagating wave of star formation. And then you rotate the whole disk differentially and you end up with spiral structure. So, where does this all lead to? Well, it leads to the idea of an actual computer program. So I wrote a program that does this. This is actually what the code looks like. And I wrote this in college, actually, when, uh, when I met my wife, Mia, we met in a class called computational physics. And this is what I was working on because I, I just thought this was so cool. There is a paper in the 70s that astronomers wrote. Now, at the time when they created these uh, simulations, like I'm showing you, this was all done by printing out dot matrix stuff. They couldn't do basically this stuff or nearly as many iterations, uh, but they use the same idea 
And that was the inspiration behind this code. And I've always wanted to write it, but it requires a certain level of, uh, you know, doing it iteratively that's hard to do. So this is actually all the code does. You, you make the galaxy just out of rings, as I described, you display it at least once. You have to initialize the galaxy, making some stars blow up in it so it does something. And then you, you draw it. And then you go in here and you update the galaxy. And then you draw it again. And then you update the galaxy and you draw it again and so on. Uh, but you're updating by the rules that I described. And the rules are basically, um, if you're in neighboring, you know, uh, if you're in neighboring cells or clouds, you have the small chance that you are going to trigger star formation. And uh, just for fun, one of the difficult things about this idea is that you have to know what a neighbor is. This is the part that's hard. Because when you rotate these rings, or you, yeah, you rotate the rings, you have differential rotation. So this guy looks like it's next to this guy, but that's only true now. In a couple of iterations, as you go along, that's no longer true, uh, they'll be separated from one another. So how did I calculate neighbors for, you know, if this is my, if this is the guy right here, how do I know that these are possible neighbors right here that could be triggered? Well, what you do is you say, well, how many cells are in a ring? And I know the angle that I'm at currently. So if you just define some angle here, I can say, well, I'm currently at this angle here. So I'm gonna to go to that same angle in the next ring that's outward of me. And then I'll look at the neighboring cells that are there. And then the same thing I can do on any cells in their inner ring. And of course, for this cell here, there's one cell to the right and one cell to the left. So I can define all the neighbors of each cell. And then I, once I have found all those neighbors, I apply the rule, which is there's a small chance that any one of them could be triggered into doing star formation. And uh, if they're triggered, well, fine. If they're not, then they just age one more year until they age out, and then they just die out completely. If you apply these rules, you end up with uh, something that looks like actually a spiral galaxy. So this program I wrote, but, it's, but I don't have the ability, because it is so computationally intensive to do this for all of these pixels and then render the screen correctly, um, I asked for some help, and there's this wonderful guy, his name is Peter Kukul, who knows how to program, and, and uh, just this brilliant guy. And so I gave him my code, and he basically made it in a form that is now available, actually. Uh, we'd like to make this available to people if it's kind of a, just a toy to play with. And if there's any interest from people, I'd like to know that, because this is the first time anyone's seeing it. Um, but basically, I think if I, can I restart this? How do I restart? I wonder if I just go there. So if you start from the beginning, now this might not display well on Zoom, and I apologize, it might look choppy, but I think you can get the idea how things evolve through time. You can see the star formation occurring within clouds and how they are persisting because the star formation is enough that you, uh, you're generating enough formation to trigger propagation of star formation while rotating the whole thing. And if you do this through time with a number, uh, uh, you know, enough iterations, you get something that looks like a spiral galaxy. Simple rules, right? Uh, but you get something that looks like reality. And I think that that's, I think that's really cool. And I think it adds another label, uh, another level rather to the stories that you show. This to me is a simulation. If you just stop time here, this looks like the HA image of M33 at some level. And then if you could watch it through time, perhaps you would see something that looks like this as simulated through cellular automata. So that was the other kind of perspective I wanted to give. Is the whole reason I wanted to give this talk was to show that uh, uh, there are other ways of kind of communicating these interesting ideas at that link to things that you show or process or express in astrophotography, uh, but then even go maybe another step further. Let me be sure that was the end, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, that was the end. So that's what I wanted to show. And I thank you very much for giving me that extra time to, to do it. Uh, and if there are any questions or anything like that, I am, I'm really happy to, uh, to address anything. 
Adam, that's almost a uh, simulation of what I would what they would call the density wave theory in a, in a strange yeah. kind of way. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Self propagating. Yep. 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 Here, let me. Here, while we're talking, I'll just let it go because it's cool. <laughs> sure. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments? Yep. Or she'll have to unmute yourself, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free. So like I said, it wasn't a technical talk. Nope. It was more just really giving you my thoughts about some things in astrophotography, some things to think about, some things to look for. Um, did I hit the right notes, Richard? Was that something along the lines of uh, what you a expect? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we were looking for something general that would maybe inspire people to begin taking images. That's the okay. whole point of our SIG here. Yep. Good, good. Adam, I do have a, a question for you. I've been an imager for a long time too, and I was glad to see you, you touched on like CCD stack. Where do you <laughs> where do you see the programs going? I mean, Pix Insights an amazing product. How yeah. do you how do you see you know programs evolving moving forward? Do you see them actually getting further and further down? I mean, expanding even more. I don't know. You know, one of the things that I think is going to happen soon is that uh, this is especially true of the the Vera Rubin Observatory, right? Mm -hmm. There, I think, are going to, going to be more public outlets for data. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, some of the software that we'll see in the future will be able to accommodate the ability to, you know, download and process and handle and whatever uh, some of these other sources of data. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to be part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know what? I don't know what the universe holds as far as, um, you know, software goes. There are always different algorithms which optimize image processing. I think PixInsight yeah. at the moment has uh, the largest collection of those, those processes and algorithms. So it's a very powerful program. And yeah. obviously what I'm, uh, what I'm instructing with at, at my site. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Thank you. A question, please. Uh, many of the images that you've shown uh, have thousands of little dots on, like that. Yes. Yeah. Are they all stars? Yes. Those are stars. Now it depends. Some of the images, some of the images were wide field images. So now I'll I'll veer away here. Um, so an image like uh, this is a wide field image, right? And because it's a wide field image, you're not seeing the, all the stars are so tiny. They're about the size of a pixel. Whereas when you take a picture with a big telescope like this, stars, the, what's called the point spread function, stars don't fit in a single pixel because of diffraction, because of the nature of optics. They are spread out among many pixels. So they look like bigger blobs. And that's just uh, due to the focal length. So when you do a wide field image, you have tiny stars. And when you look through a big telescope, you have big blobby stars. Uh, but that's just a function of the optics. Stars, of course, are actually dots at infinity effectively uh but uh but yeah that's the difference so but yes in this image those are all stars as well as this image they're in our galaxy yes and this is another perspective this was the most important thing that i had to that i felt like was my mission was that during the course of the public programs i was sure that in all the perspectives that i gave by the end of the night when people looked up at the sky and they saw all of those stars overhead, I knew that they knew, because I made it a big deal, that all of those stars that they saw, they are all well within our own galaxy. You need to look at another galaxy to truly be looking out and away from our own. These other galaxies are so far away, you don't see individual stars. You just see the combined glow of billions of them. So it's only within our own galaxy that we're seeing these individual stars. It's mind-boggling. <laughs> well, that, that, that's part of the fun. Yeah. Definitely part yeah. of the fun. Uh, not a real question, but uh, certainly I'd like to say that I appreciate uh, the, the perspective um, that you brought in, you know, speaking about perspective and telling a story with astrophotography. I, you know, I've done, you know, many pictures, um, but never really approached uh, a picture um, with such depth, uh, you know, to think through uh, how do I um, present that image in such a way 
uh, to tell a story and how might that uh, govern the choices I make when collecting that data and then exactly. subsequently processing that data. Exactly. Um, so almost, uh, you know, working backwards uh, with that intent in mind, right to the beginning of that uh, data collection. Um, and so I really appreciate uh, hearing that perspective and, and getting that inspiration from you. Thank you very much. So you're, you're welcome. Thank you. And this, and I want to give due credit here. One of the questions that I would get often in a workshop when I would used to give workshops in person, still get it even in my videos, is that people want to know after they calibrate the data and they're working with the images, they want to know after they do the initial stuff, what, how do you know what to do next? And if you ask Ansel Adams, you see, the way that he would look at an image through his camera is he would not see what he saw through the viewfinder. It's what he saw in his mind's eye that was important. And so he would, in his words, pre-visualize. He would literally think not of what he sees in front of him as it is, but what he wants it to be. And so, of course, we are constrained. It's, well, some people are not constrained. I'm constrained <laughs> by the data itself in that there's only certain degrees of freedom that I have. You know, if the object's not blue and I wanted to make it blue or something, that's, that's kind of odd, right? But within the constraints that I have, there are certainly those choices where I want to retain certain features that tell that story. And if I do certain kinds of processing that destroy that, I don't want that. And so when I initially see the data, I can see those features. I know that they're there. Um, and I want to retain them. I want to make those choices that, you know, give me that opportunity that by the end, I still see them in my image. And that's what makes me happy. And I hope that's what other people find compelling about the images. Very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, here and no one else, we'll uh, kind of give you a round of applause here. And uh, thank you for joining us. That was a fantastic presentation. And yeah, I thank hope you, you. And I do hope you, uh, you know, accept another invitation to give a more technical talk on Pix Insight processing oh, in the future. That would be that would be wonderful. I would certainly enjoy that very much. And uh, just uh, yeah, send me the send me the invitation when you're ready for that. Absolutely. We, we, we'd like to give our speakers a little break. I won't have you back this season, but perhaps next season. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We could have you every night, but I think that'd be too much. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks again, Adam. Okay. You're welcome. Should I uh, drop off or are you guys going to do anything else? No, we're going to have our kind of the rest of our regular meeting. Uh, you're welcome to stay. Okay. Uh, but uh, if you have to go and process images, I totally understand. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's uh, 630. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going to hang out for a few minutes and see how you guys uh, behave. No, I just going to see what your, <laughs> what your meetings are like. And, uh, and th yeah, then I'll just, I'll drop out. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So let's uh, go ahead and begin with the rest of the meeting here. Uh, the first thing we have on the agenda, if you still have that handy, is we're going to share our latest images that we have taken. So I, I know we're, this is our first meeting. Perhaps you don't have anything ready to share yet, but if you do, um, let's, uh, let's see some of your latest images you've taken over the summer. We don't have time to look at probably all of them. I know, for example, Pete's taken too many to share tonight, but uh, Pete, you got one handy to share? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask that. Oh, boy, and you got Adam here to look at it, too. Oh, boy, no pressure. Um, uh -oh. oh, man. I'm not sure if I can bring one up or not. Yeah, I'm trying to pull it up. Slow computer. Hold on. My apologies. That's okay. Like I said, we're getting started here. People aren't used to the routine that we're going to be doing here. Of course, Pete has one of his new images in the background there. You can see it. Yeah, that's what I'm pulling up. Actually, I opened up the project in Pix Insight, which opens up everything under the sun. <laughs> My mistake. I need a faster computer, more RAM. 
maybe some, uh, maybe Adam has some uh, uh, <laughs> suggestions for. <laughs> no, there's there's no trick. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, you can use uh, NASA's Pleiades supercomputer. You can log into that. Yeah. It'll work. Okay, let me see here. I wouldn't recommend using Skynet. I've heard only bad things about that. Okay. okay. I have one. Are you ready, Pete? Yeah, let me. Okay, because I, I, have, I have mine ready. Mine's a very simple one that I want to share. So. Okay, I think I'm sharing. There we go. <clears throat> okay. So this is the uh, Cocoon Nebula and um, shot it as LRGB with... Um, a 275 millimeter um, refractor, a little triplet, um, about 14 hours worth of data. Um, I'm just trying to think here. Just basic, just starting to use this little refractor. Uh, nice little uh, dark nebula in there. Boatloads of uh, star in here, as you know. Um, and like Adam was saying here, you know, the story, I'm, I, I've been so focused on galaxies for so long, I wanted to zoom out and actually explore, especially the Milky Way, you know, what's going on. Um, and for some reason, I thought there was more dark nebula in this area. Um, actually, the H-alpha data I have for this, which I haven't really incorporated, is this whole area is awash in H-alpha. So I was really pleased with that. But um, this is probably one of my... Uh, or recent projects, but I won't use all my time here. I don't know if anyone else has anything. Right. Any questions for Pete about his image? And, and I'm glad Pete did share some details in there. That's one thing I forgot to mention. You know, this isn't a general meeting where we just share pretty pictures to ooh and out of the crowd. We're here. Yeah. For, we're here for details. Yeah, here's some information. It was uh, 40, 49 by 600 seconds um, for my luminance. 30 by 300 for the uh, uh, RGB. Um, I was using an old 8300 uh, Kodak based camera. Um, kind of uh, Bortle 4 skies out here, some kind of dark, sort of dark, Not nothing super bright. Um, the image scale is about four arc seconds a pixel. So I did do a drizzle integration um, to handle the, um, otherwise everything was pretty blocky on here. So um, so the drizzle did really a good job of, um, actually I can show you what it looked like. Hold on. You can actually look in here. It's, oh, that's drizzled. Oh, that's drizzled too. Uh, I don't have my, uh, raw frames. I definitely had to drizzle these. This the the pixelation was pretty bad, so using drizzle is a really good uh, technique I found uh, to handle that. But anyone, anyone has any questions? So for our beginners, this is the uh, Cocoon Nebula. Uh, yep. I see fifty one forty six, I think. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, this is way up in Cygnus. It's practically on the border of uh, Cepheus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great shot. Yeah. Um, the Pix Insight, when I did the, the alignment, there's like 19,500 stars, which is about, all oh, right. That's about it. Okay, we'll pause here to count them. Wait, that's yeah. too late. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I got one handy to share. I, I thought I'd go in... Um, I, I knew people would start out with the whiz bang wow images. I thought I would kind of go in the opposite direction here. So uh, last week we had a nice uh, conjunction of the waxing crescent moon and Venus. So while I was out at the Kalamazoo Nature Center doing some imaging of uh, the Cocoon Nebula for, for one and also the Andromeda Galaxy, I ran out to Northwest and Javanue with basically a stationary tripod and my um, uh, Sigma 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens and took this image here. So I can give you the, the, uh, the technical details here. So this was taken with my Canon uh, 6D, which is a full frame DSLR camera. Uh, the lens was set at F4 and the focal length uh, worked out to be about 108 millimeters. 
you know, I just twist the zoom lens until I'm happy with the framing. Uh, this is a four second exposure at ISO 400. And it was pretty much uh, processed in um, Lightroom. I really didn't use uh, Photoshop at all. So Lightroom helps you, you know, uh, do a little bit of processing. I, it's um, helpful to uh, flatten the image, you know, do lens correction so it's not distorted. I do have some noise down here. I did do uh, in noise reduction in the camera because that helps remove hot pixels that are really difficult to get rid of later. But it, it just goes to show you, you know, not all astrophotography has to be incredibly complex. I like doing the complex stuff, but I'm really slow on the processing just because I'm too busy doing so much for the club. So it, it is nice to take pictures like this. They're very gratifying. They're really, really quick and easy to do. And um, they're just really fun to take too. That's my favorite part. My favorite part is just taking the pictures. All right, anybody else have any pics to share? I got a couple. I don't know who that was, but go ahead, share your screen. Okay, uh, let me see. I, I, ha I, I have Zoom set, so I don't see people uh, that are hiding their video, so that's probably why I can't see it. <laughs> ah, there we go. So I'm just getting, just getting started, and so, um, I haven't really got any long exposures of nebulas or anything yet, but I do like to chase the, um, the Milky Way around. And so um, here's one of my images that I uh, was out at uh, two, three in the morning taking of Mount Shasta. Uh, it's obviously not from Michigan. We don't have any of those uh, tall rocky things there. Right. <laughs> We've got such a drought. This was in March. Uh, we've got such a drought. There's no snow on those mountains now. And it's the first time in maybe history that it's ever take, people have taken pictures with absolutely no snow because of the drought. Yeah, very nice. I like uh, M6 and M7 there. M7 almost looks like a uh, like a star on top of a Christmas tree with the tree there. Did so you uh, did you use a light to uh, light up the road? I did. Uh, I did. I did a little bit, not much. I mean, yeah. um, kind of, it'd be nice if, if it went further out somehow, <laughs> it'd be tough. But it'd be yeah. Nice. Well, I, yeah, I just, I just wanted to kind of, I was taking without anything. And then I thought, well, it'd be nice to let people see that yes. I am in a road. Yes. And I, um, so about every 30 minutes or so, this car would <clears throat> come down the road and I yeah. didn't run them to really see I was out there. So I'd grab my tripod and run over and hide behind a tree and let the car go by. <laughs> and then I go back out. <laughs> so that, that was a trip I took. Uh, we we're on the coast. I was over towards Eastern California in the Northern section, sort of Mount Shasta was. And I did take another one of um, with Mount Lassen in the background, but um, I'm not going to show them all, but I am going to show you one other one. Um, we have a, I belong to Astronomers of Humboldt, and that's here in Humboldt County in uh, Northern California. And we have access to, uh, well, first of all, we have a lot of fog here along the coast. And so there's a, at 2,700 feet, about 45 minutes away, we can go to an airport and the Astronomers of Humboldt have access to where we can, because it's only a night, a daytime airport, we can go out there and set up our tripods out on nice flat pavement on the runway. And so um, sometimes you, this, I took another picture of the runway from the edge of the galaxy. And um, this is what I got here. Um, I got there before the galaxy had risen. And so I waited for a couple hours watching the sky get uh, bright along the edge where that fence is. And you can see the windsock there. And um, so I, I started there about 10 and I didn't take this one until about two. And after I could start to see the galaxy was getting, starting to pass by and I was gonna get beyond it, that's when I snapped this picture. And this has been pretty popular with the locals, you know, to see this, uh, this particular picture from the Neyland Airport. Very nice, Rick, good start. 
Well, I'm working on it. <laughs> I don't. I don't think maybe you can see. Yeah, you can see a little more of it here. Yeah, oh, there you go. The, oh, yeah. Okay. It's just. Um, yeah, this is where it started. This is where I was really kind of. There was a bunch of other photographers up there from the camera club, and there wasn't really room for me to go where I normally went. So I went down the road, and I just sort of hung out. And it's fun to uh, see vir virtually nothing until you take a picture, you know, and you go, oh, there is the Milky Way. It's coming up. And so, um, yeah, this one here is probably my best shot so far this year. So. And uh, by the way, this was taken with a Canon RA. <laughs> so I'm really happy with it. I mean, it's just a straight shot. So, anyway, that's my sharing for today. Very good. First time I've shared anything with anybody. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's fun. Great. Oh, no, those are great. Now, let's see. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Dave or? Dave, you got well, one? I don't. I don't have anything prepared, unfortunately. Um, oh, I, uh, meant, I meant Dave, Dave Gart, but yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, You're Dave. I, I do. Okay, I I, I will uh, share if I can. Sure, David. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, a picture that uh, several people here, I think, have already seen, but I think does. Uh, Hopefully you can see that. Uh, tell a story, um, maybe not so much about the physics that are happening uh, out in space, so much as the physics uh, happening right on my objective lens uh, <laughs> because of uh, condensation and, and dew yeah. formation. I, I didn't yeah. realize. Um, but this has become really one of my favorite photos. Uh, this was, uh, again, um, taken on uh, the wee hours of the night of July 3rd. So I guess it was the wee morning hours of July 4th. And my wife told me once she said that I had captured the first fireworks uh, of the holiday. Um, and I've shown this to others. And uh, the other story that I think this tells is um, what unexpected re results you can get when, when things go wrong. So, uh, so Dave, check this out. So my image of the Orion Nebula, I used what is called a fog filter. Yeah, this is the fog filter by a company called Tiffin uh, to basically get the same effect that you did with the condensation on your, your lens. So yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a, a common it, thing that people do. They get these filters to uh, put in front of their lenses. That's that's, really yeah, cool. that's interesting. Yeah, it was, very, it was incredibly yeah. humid that night. And uh, I didn't realize that... Uh, this was the effect that it was having on my on my data. Uh, this is the Seder region. I've got uh, uh, another picture the very next night. Uh, so that I guess it would have been the night of July fourth, uh, early morning of July fifth of the same region. It wasn't so humid, uh, humid, and uh, you know it looks as as you would expect it with the uh, you know uh, not so many blown out stars and, and not so much uh, saturation of the colors. Um, but this has become one of my favorite photos and I think tells uh, a couple of stories, uh, one of which uh, you never, you may never know what uh, you'll get when things go wrong. So I have a question. Um, this was condensation. Have you tried using a heater for your lens? I do have dew heaters. Uh, okay. This was early on. Um, and uh, I just didn't think to bring them with me, and and I just didn't notice. Uh, we were camping, and and so uh, um, distracted by other things at the time. While while my uh, my right. imaging. Well, it's a great set up. great shot. I mean, I've just got acquired some of those data. Like so. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just got a dew heater. I mean, it's a little thing that runs off USB, and you put it around your lens. So, Adam, do you know what dew is? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> Mountain tops actually have it. Okay. Yeah. So I remember. I remember years ago. Remember Psi dot Astro dot Amateur. There was this guy from Arizona, you know, observing his whole life, experienced do for the first time, and posted what to do on uh, on the news group there, and people just flamed him, saying, "Oh, you're <laughs> you're disgusting," because you know, so some of us go home soaking wet because it gets yeah. so Oh yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this is the this is the fog filter 
that it probably doesn't look like much on the camera, but this is the fog filter that's used to basically get the same effect. Because if you take a picture like um, Rick's picture of the Milky Way, but you want Antares and some of the bright stars to stand out, I mean, they're just so small that this is the filter that allows you to get that picture and show what looks like the constellation stars. They'll show up. Um, and it doesn't do much harm to the small star. So it, it has that kind of naked eye in this view to it. All right, Mr. Garden. Oh, you're gonna put me my turn, huh? Only if you want to. Uh, I'm not, I'm not yeah, gonna... I got one here. I guess, well, I just been learning PicSight this early spring. I just started using it. So I guess I'll show you my uh, first picture I processed in, in PicSight. Now, if I can share a screen here. Uh, how to share. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of Pacifics on it, but the California Nebula. Does everybody see that one? I'm not, not yet. Is it up? I, no, I got it on my screen here. Oh, uh, maybe, there we go. Uh, there it is. There we go. Hey, uh, what's going on here? Oh, you got it? That's it. I see it. Yeah, yeah that's my uh, first picture I ever processed. And uh, and I'm still learning a lot. That's ZWO 16200. I can't remember how long it framed. I think there were 300 seconds. But I still got a long ways to go. That's a good start, Dave. That looks real good. I don't know if I got another one here. Well, I guess that'll be good. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, share here or what? Here, how does this work? I think we're back. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Uh, we can maybe share a few images after the official time here, but I didn't want to uh, take up too much of everyone's time. Um, I, I do have uh, interesting images from other astrophotographers. And there is one I wanted to share. You probably all saw it, but I was, I was shocked when I read the, uh, the caption. So here is uh, yesterday's astronomy picture of the day. You know, when I first saw it like this, you know, I, and, and glanced at it, I was like, that, that's something from the Hubble Space Telescope because the, uh, the uh, dark nebulosity here is so excruciatingly detailed. But then I, you know, click on um, this gentleman's link here, Andrew Klinger relation to Maxwell Klinger from MASH, of course. And uh, here's his uh, image. And so it was, it was taken with the William Optics uh, GT81, the 80 mil 81 millimeter refractor, I assume. So I was uh, amazed by the resolution of this image. I won't bother, you can glance at the details here real quick, but remember this was yesterday's APOD. So you can check out the details yourself, but it's just remarkable the images people are getting today. That resolution, it, it's just really exquisite. So you can you can check out the full resolution version there, and uh, check it out. So that was that was one recent image that really amazed uh, me. Hmm. Is it, you said that's the A pod today? That was yesterday's A pod. The the one for today is the, of the object that uh, struck Jupiter. A little little video of that. Okay, so I don't know if anyone uh, saw any other recent images to share, but you know, probably don't have them handy because remember we're kind of getting into the routine here. We're just getting started. Uh, the next thing I can is... show. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, Arya. Uh, these are old ones, just like what you show. Uh, how can I share them my uh, screen? Yeah, there's there's a little button down there that says uh, share screen. So just click on that and pick your screen. Um, well. well, we'll come back to it, are you? Okay. So just at the top. Keep uh, practicing on that. Uh, another new thing is that, that I want to do every month is uh, new astrophotography related equipment and software. We can talk about stuff we purchased 
and new stuff that just came out on the market. Um, the one thing I wanted to share is uh, here is my, um, I think I'm sharing my video. Oh, I'm not sharing my video, am I? Uh, so here I am. Uh, so this is my uh, T adapter uh, for the Celestron Edge HD uh, line of telescopes. I have the nine and a quarter inch Edge HD. And the one thing that really irks me about this uh, T adapter is there's nowhere to include uh, two inch filters, you know, like say an Optolong L enhanced filter or something like that. So I was looking around and went to Star Arizona's website and they have uh, this one here. And you're probably thinking, hey, it looks, uh, it looks exactly the same. And let me make myself the spotlight here. Yeah, I don't see you. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes, there you go. Okay. So you guys can see me there. So here's my uh, Star Arizona T adapter. And it looks pretty much like the other one. So I'll, if you didn't see me before, there's the uh, Celestron version. Right. That, that does not take filters. And here's the Star Arizona version. So I can unscrew it here, which the Celestron one cannot do. Make sure I don't drop it. Really? I... And there is a, I already have a filter in there. So there's my L enhanced filter uh, threaded on to the back of the T adapter. So um, if you have an Edge HD telescope like me and you want to use a two inch filter because of the rampant light pollution we have to deal with around here, uh, I found this a really little handy thing. And uh, one of these days I may actually use it, but between the remote telescope and the Ashby telescope, I haven't been using my own stuff and I don't know how long. <laughs> so wh where did, what's the name of that again? It's, that... I, it's from Star Arizona in, in Arizona. Okay. Because that's here. exactly what I, I've got the same issue. I, I can't put anything between, you know, between my camera and the telescope right now because I have that same adapter you just showed. Yeah. Yep. So it's from Star Arizona. It's, it's pretty easy to find on their website. I don't, the only thing that right. really hurt, you know, the, the, the one thing I'll say negative about it is it didn't come in a box. <laughs> it, it was just wrapped in bubble wrap thrown into a packaging box and I like to keep my stuff in boxes so it doesn't get scratched up from other stuff so so do they have different cameras they attach to because you know the the, the part that attaches to your camera has to be unique for yeah this will basically accept uh, you know ZWO cameras and uh, DSLR cameras with the T adapter and uh, but, but of course uh, they're you know unless you have the clip-in filter for your DSLR you know there's nowhere to put a filter but at the right. time, anyway, when I bought my Optolong filter, they weren't offering a, a clip-in filter. I don't know if they are now or not, but I, ha I have the two-inch version. So, yeah, there's I, a you could put a front end on that um, RA camera with the with the caddy for two filters in there, but I I would rather just try and start out with being able to slip one in like you do there with a different adapter going into the telescope. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any new equipment that they want to share or? Yeah, I, I do, Richard. I can Me. show. Oh, I'm lazy. I'm not going to go out to the observatory, but I'll show you the camera. Um, uh, on the left here, I got a, I bought a, a spike of flat, um, flat field uh, frame, um, generator so I can get a nice, a um, lot more uh, consistent flat field. So it's the, basically I could turn it on. Oh, I should probably, I could turn it on right now, actually. Um, so yeah, so I have it on a, um, a, uh, it's, it's a, we're looking inside my dome right now. So I have it on a uh, computer uh, monitor arm. And so, um, so I can just, I have a park position for the um, AP mount so I can just send off the mount to point at it. And then, so when my imaging is done, I just pointed it at, at it and takes the flat frames. Um, I think I can actually- Pete, what, what is the name of that again? It's called Spike A flat, Spica. So S P I K A flat. Um, should be able to turn it on here real quick. It's a. This one has a USB control. You just gotta. Oops, I just gotta wait. Wait for it to turn on here a minute. Oh. I don't have it plugged in. Well, if I had it plugged in, 
if I had it plugged in, I would actually be able to turn it on. But yeah, it's a USB control and I can control it through Sequence Generator Pro too. So then that's what it does. Sequence Generator just turns it on, sets up the brightness levels. My filters automatically takes the flats for me. So, and then the mount just points to it. I have it as a custom park position, points it off to the left. Um, so, or I can set it on top. Um, the only thing I haven't figured out is how to point, because I have two scopes on there right now. I have the refractor on the right and the RC on the left. And I can't, it's only a 12 inch diameter. So, and I can't fit them both at the same time. So, but so far it's done excellent flat fields. I mean, super consistent each time when I put it at 10 or 50 or whatever the, the brightness level, um, it's been very consistent. Um, and it's worked great for my broadband all the way up through um, my narrow band filters. My, my S2 filter, which is usually the hardest one to, to do, it's, it's only been uh, like a 10 second exposure. And my, um, my, uh, my luminance actually is like one second. Um, and that's actually too short because my CCD has a mechanical shutter and it's too short. I get those shadow effects. So I got to figure out how to slow it down a little bit. But anyway, flat fields, pretty important. <laughs> Spike of flat, I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty cool. They're uh, made out of Wisconsin. Um, they, this, there's two sizes. There's this size and there's one actually bigger. It'll handle up to like a 16 inch OTA. Um, um, this one, when you buy it, you can actually, um, it has like a little dial that you can do. You can manually adjust the brightness. I got the one with the USB control, and then you can control it through Sequence Generator Pro or all the, there's a various um, um, automation software you can use, or they actually make a little a little program that you can just like uh, pre-program it for your camera uh, telescope uh, configuration so you can quickly adjust the brightnesses. Um, and it wasn't that bad, it was like 199 bucks, I think, for it. So it wasn't too horrible. A lot cheaper um, than the uh, Optech one that we got. Yeah, of course that op <laughs> that Optech is like ginormous. Yeah, that's a big one. Anyway, anyway they, that's all I got. They've got it on the web on their website for two uh, sixty nine ninety five. Oh, two sixty nine ninety five. Okay, sorry, I misspoke. All right, Arya, you got your picture there. Yep. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, this is something similar to what you showed. Ma. This was taken in. Uh, I think May uh, this year, I was uh, very difficult to find uh, Mercury, but this year I saw it right next to the crescent moon. Oh, there you go. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think the Venus is right on the tree line on the very way bottom in the, somewhere in the mid middle middle of the picture. Okay, cool. You can barely see like by, by the la 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 uh, telephone post. That's very nice. Yeah. You got the technical was, details, Andy, are you? Huh? You got the technical details? Uh, I think I can see, look at it. And basically, it's my camera D60 um, and on a tripod. And uh, I usually I try with the different exposures and uh, like at different times and, and uh, try, to, try to frame the, these two trees. This was in Schoolcraft. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Arya. All right. Uh, moving on here. Um, I want to make a few announcements. Um, next month, we uh, or not next yeah next month uh, very early next month we have uh, astrophotography night. Um, I've been kind of wondering if we should probably even uh, consider continuing astrophotography night if the SIG really continues. Um, so just for quick uh, promo promotional uh, notices here, there is the registration link for astrophotography night because we're going to continue on Zoom for basically the rest of the year. So of course, we've been doing astrophotography night since at least the 70s. I believe Eric Schreuer started it uh, way back in the day. Uh, in the early 70s. So uh, that's where we basically share our best images with the uh, membership and any guests we happen to have. 
so one thing we can do here at a SIG meeting is organize Astro Photo Night a bit better. I'll do this by email as well, but if you plan on sharing images during Astrophotography Night, please email me because we want to organize that a little better so we don't go, you know, two and a half, three hours of people sharing pictures. So, you know, if we have like, uh, you know, six, six people and we want to kind of keep it to at least an hour, then you'll only, you know, you'll only be able to share, you know, just a handful of images. So we'll do the math later. It just depends on how many people we have. But if, again, if you plan to share images uh, during Astro Photo Night on October 1st, contact me and I'll uh, email you back uh, maybe the day before the meeting or something like that and tell you at least how much time you have um, or at least how many images you can share. So we want to do that in a more organized uh, fashion. Uh, I want to give you an update on the KAS remote telescope since of course it is used for imaging. If you are a uh, new Kalamazoo Astronomical Society member or um, you're a guest here, we do have a excellent uh, facility near Portal, Arizona. And we, we just decided to call it the KAS Remote Telescope. I thought about giving it a fancy name, but it was kind of discussed and, uh, you know, many people contributed to this project and we didn't want to really name it after one person. It was a really large uh, group process for us. so. So, yep, we just kind of generically call it the KAS Remote Telescope, which is composed of two elements here. Click on the first one here. We have, have of course, the 20-inch uh, the plane wave, the 4-inch uh, Takahashi on a paramount. And uh, as of yesterday, it is uh, mostly back online. I did uh, successfully uh, take an image of M8, the Lagoon Nebula, just a quick five-minute shot with the H-alpha filter. And I took a shot of M16 just for giggles. Uh, but the Takahashi isn't quite ready yet. I was not able to uh, connect to the RoboFocus. Uh, Jim keeps changing the COM ports on me all the time, Jim Kurtz. And I kind of keep having to tell him, you know, don't, don't do that. Uh, so I might try it again tonight. I might try to log on to the remote scope and go right to the Takahashi and see if I can uh, focus. But as of now, uh, the remote scope is back online if you just want to use the plane wave. So I don't know if we're quite ready to take reservations yet. I want to, you know, I, I think the plane wave is ready to go. I want to check the Takahashi. And I'd like to uh, maybe do a new set of flats with our Optech flat screen you can see here. There it goes. And, uh, but I'll probably send out an email here soon. But I wanted to give everyone at the SIG meeting a uh, preview that the, um, remote telescope is ready to go. And one thing I'd like to do as part of the SIG uh, is as we meet in future, you know, in, in, in future meetings is we can spend time talking about any group imaging projects we want to do. Because maybe, you know, it's really easy to use the telescope to take the pictures, but maybe you're not quite ready to do the processing yet. But if we can uh, agree on a target and all contribute images. Uh, one of us can process it and share the images with others. And you can share it with your friends. You can share it on social media. So um, one example is uh, toward the end of last season, I started doing a series of images of the Rosette Nebula. I wanted to do a really long exposure, narrow band series of images with, you know, H-alpha, the sulfur-2, and the O3 filter. And so if you think you might be willing to contribute um, to that, you know, use part of your remote telescope time to take images of the Rosette, Rosette Nebula, and I've been using the plane wave because I want to get up close, um, perhaps we could work on that together. So that's just one example. And I wanted to um, give you a rundown of the other facility that we have. Of course, the remote telescope is under the incredibly dark desert skies of Arizona, not terribly far from where Adam Block uh, is right now. But we do have Owl Observatory here at the Kalamazoo Nature Center. This is our 12 by 12 roll-off roof observatory. And of course, we just uh, dedicated the new Leonard James Ashby Telescope. So of course we have the Astrophysics 1600 mount with the 16 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, we do have a focal reducer for this, but we're still working on uh, 
uh, figuring out a way to properly attach that with the starlight focuser here. Uh, but most of the imaging I've done with this setup has been with the uh, uh, Teleview 101 here. And uh, I can show you all, all the equipment we have besides the mount and the two scopes. Of course, we have a Coronado uh, H-alpha filter. So if you want to image the sun in H-alpha, I'm not sure our camera really works for that, but I can elaborate that uh, later. We do have, um, of course, a, a complete dew system. We have the uh, ZWO ASI 071 uh, color camera. We do have an Optolong uh, L Enhance filter. We have an Optolong L Pro filter. We use Sequence Generator Pro to control everything. We have a uh, Orion Auto Guider with uh, PHD2 installed on the computer out there. So if you're thinking, I, I don't have any of the equipment necessary to do astrophotography, but of course, if you uh, uh, do live in the Kalamazoo area, uh, you can have access to the remote telescope because you have to be a member in Southwest Michigan to use the remote telescope. We get emails all the time from people across the country asking if they can join and use the remote telescope. And so far the answer is no, but if you want to use something on site, we have the Ashby telescope uh, just waiting to be used by other people. So I just wanted to mention that. Any, any, any comments about any of that? Okay, so the last thing is a preview for next month's meeting. Uh, I think he's still here, so. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Okay, Jonathan, you're <laughs> here. So go ahead and give us a preview for next month's uh, feature presentation. Yeah, so, um, so I'm Jonathan Young. Uh, I've been an astro imager maybe for the last seven or eight years or so. Uh, I'm a class of 2000 CAMC grad, so I'm local to Kalamazoo where I grew up. Uh, and since then, I've been, you know, lots of engineering work, but from the astro side of things, uh, I've been kind of evolving my craft a little bit, have a lot of lessons learned to share with the group, particularly imaging from uh, Southern Michigan as a whole, a uh, lot of tricks to deal with, you know, object position, uh, any of the smoke issues that we deal with here, uh, being under the jet stream all the time. So I uh, have a few images I can share. Um, I'm on my iPad right now, so I haven't been able to share anything today. Um, but uh, kind of the process, um, I'll give a few tutorials through Surreal, which is a stacking program uh, that is also freeware, just like Deep Sky Stacker, but it gives you a little bit additional functionality, additional gradient control. And then also, um, we've heard a lot about Pix Insight, but I'll actually show a few steps through Star Tools and a way to do a few combinations of uh, kind of different methods for narrowband, really, in the end. You know, whether we want to do a like a tone map approach or a, you know, special boosted uh, items or just using HA's luminance. There's a lot of different ways you can do it and a lot of, uh, I guess, different uh, kind of skills that you can use and uh, the key thing is you know really as long as you're persistent you can get pretty good images from around here with fairly modest equipment i use basically a five and a half inch refractor for most of my images um you know not the 20 inch plane waves that i would love to have but uh, for the most part uh you know modest equipment pairing your uh camera correctly uh, some additional diligence on the processing side and, you know, I'll help share some of those tricks. Great. We're looking forward to it, Jonathan. And a uh, quick update. I will not be using the remote telescope tonight. It is really cloudy out there. <laughs> so it's actually better here than it is out there. That's, that's a rarity. Oh, well, yeah. what are you going to oh, do? The clouds have rolled in here. All right. So this month, of course, we had a very general presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. And as Jonathan outlaid there, we're going to basically dive right in. We're going to get to the nitty gritty here. So that'll be the Astrophotography SIG meetings. We got some pretty good meetings uh, coming up. You can go to the uh, KAS website under activities. You can pull up the Astrophotography SIG and you can see our full schedule. We basically have speakers for every month except for May. I'm kind of looking for something in the range of planetary imaging or maybe specifically solar imaging. And um, so if you have any ideas about that, let me know. So otherwise, that concludes our official meeting.
And I want to thank you all for joining us. I know we had uh, over 60 here tonight. I don't suspect we'll have that many for a regular SIG meeting. But again, this was our first night. It was a special night with a special guest speaker. And I, again, want to thank you all for joining us. So keep imaging.